the previous lecture I talked about basic classification. Um, where's the slide? That's really weird. There it goes. Uh, and we ended by looking at three different types of classifiers, a, a decision tree, which is not really, it is a classifier, but it doesn't really run the normal like classification way. You have to sort of split the data yourself. We talked about naive bays, give an example of that on gender, then maximum entropy. So what this lecture is going to do is just do more examples of naive bays. So we're going to look a little bit more at how to build the classifier and to think about um, feature extraction. Okay. So in the previous lecture, we talked about investigating gender. So can I predict someone's gender, which is a simple binary classification, by looking at the last letter or the last two letters of their name? That will be the chapter six homework, is improving on what we did in class for that. Now, not everything has to be binary, right? A lot of you are probably familiar with logistic regression, and a lot of times that is also used as a classifier. Uh, not in this course, because we often um, get better results from naive Bayes uh, or um, a maximum entropy type classifier. Um, but from, for law regression, moving into three or more categories gets to be complex, right? Because you get multiple equations or many, many weird predictors. Instead, the, the naive base kind of handles the fact that there might be 15 different categories a little better. Okay. Um, there's also support vector machines, models, support, SVN. Um, so there are other options than the one we're, we're covering here. We're just going to talk about the, the best options that are included in NLTK. Uh, the nice thing about some newer packages like Spacey is they have uh, more of the kind of traditional machine learning. It allows you to use other packages like SkyKit, SkyKitLearn in it. <clears throat> so in this example, I'm going to try to classify documents. Okay. So I'm not going to classify gender. I'm going to classify an entire document. So instead of focusing on a single word, the person's name, we're going to focus on a, a text blob. And the most popular way to do, one of the most popular corpora for this is movie reviews. Okay. And so this movie reviews data set have either been marked as positive or negative. So this is a really big sentiment example. Okay. And so what we would do is import those movie reviews okay. and just create a list of documents. So when you're using data for this, remember you have to have the data that you want to try to classify with. This is either the name or in this case it's the document, whatever you're using as your feature set. And then also the answer, right? So you have to have a set of answers to build a trainer. So what we're doing here is pulling out the words from the review and what category the review went into, so it's either positive or negative, um, looping over all of the different options that you'd have. Okay. Uh, now, category here is not like genre of a movie review. This is um, positive or negative. And so to keep myself from getting a weird test training subset, I I am going to shuffle the data. This is always a good thing. So we might get slightly different answers if you're running this on your own as well, um, because uh, depending on which parts are in the training, which parts are in the test data, we would get maybe slightly better classification for one group or another. Okay. It shouldn't be wildly different, or that implies there's something weird about your data, uh, but it might be a couple of percent points different. And so now that we have the data, we have to do rule number one. What are the features? So what do we want to extract from our data set to be able to classify it? And this is a natural language processing class. So generally, this is going to be at the level of words. Uh, and this is easy to do in sentiment. Most people focus on the word level because words have um, positivity and negativity in them. They have a polarity naturally. Some of them, some of them don't. Okay. 
So many positive reviews might contain the word liked, great, excellent, fabulous. So these kind of um, uh, adjectives that are very strong. Um, negative reviews might contain uh, hated it, it was terrible, that kind of stuff. And so it's really popular to use your feature extractor be a dictionary of the list of words that are in each uh, document. The biggest problem with this type of analysis is that it completely ignores context. So it's a binary, is it in the document or is it not in the document kind of dictionary? And that ignores sarcasm, um, idioms. So kind of the big problem we've had all semester where context does not get um, included in this type of analysis. So you often don't have enough data to allow context to matter. So for this example, and really this example only, we're just going to take the top 2,000 words. Okay? And um, you wouldn't really do this normally. You would use all of the words unless your computer just literally could not handle it. Um, but in this particular example, I want to show you like how good can we do by just looking at a small subset of, of English. So I'm going to pull out all of the words in our movie reviews. Okay. So we're going to say lowercase all these words in the word data set and just give me all of them back. I'm going to um, use the top 2,000 words. Okay. And when you're doing this, kind of rule number one is what features do you want to use? And then you build a function that allows you to extract those features from your documents. Okay. So what you would do is I'm going to build a, a document features function and I'm going to supply it each movie review one at a time. To that movie review I'm going to create a set. Right? Remember that set just creates the unique list of words that are in the data set. Um, I'm going to build a features uh, dictionary, remember dictionary are the curly brackets, and I'm going to loop over this. So for each word in our um, word features, where the heck are word features? Ah, word features up here. Okay. We're going to create a little dictionary that says, does it contain this word or not? Okay. And so literally this is like a, it's not even a tally, it's a yes, no. Here's our list of words that are possible. Is that word in this review or not? This is very similar if you're familiar with like topics models or semantic vector spaces. It's very similar to creating just a, a conditional frequency distribution of words by documents. Okay. But instead of building a nice big table text matrix, we're building little mini dictionaries. Okay. And that's simply because remember we're feeding into our classifier our um, maybe naive based classifier, a dictionary rather than the raw features themselves. So all this function does is it returns the words that are in our top 2,000 words. Um, I have figured out how many movie reviews I have. I'm creating a training set and a test set. We're going to keep those two separate. Uh, we don't want to train and test on the same data set. I am using the apply features function. Remember, this is our nice function that takes that um, user defined feature extractor, the function we just built, and applies it to a specific data set. So, my training set is um, apply my function where it counts all of the words to 90% of the data. The test set is apply that to 10%, the last 10% of the data. And I just printed that out so that you could see that it's a 90-10 split. Okay. Now we could do a um, dev train, dev test, and test. That would be a little better because then we could kind of go back and forth and figure out the best um, feature extractors for this data. But if we know the only feature extractor we want to use is words, 
then um, training and test by itself are fine. All right, so let's train our classifier. This is step two, right? So we're going to use uh, our naive base classifier here. Dot train, remember, is teaching it what to do. And so we put in the training set. And this is just using that Bayesian rule where it looks at the probability of the original labels, the positive and negative. It inputs the probability of each feature, two positive, two negative, and creates a classification score for each document based on those probabilities. So they're shifting around based on the input of the features. And then we get sort of the prior probability, I'm sorry, the posterior probabilities. So what's the likelihood after I've seen the data? So I start with what's the likelihood just as a random guess, and the best random guess is the natural split in the data. So it's 50-50, if it's 50-50, I don't know if it is. Um, then the best guess is a coin flip. But if the data naturally has more positive reviews, the best guess is positive. I take all those features, I uh, kind of collectively add their weights to the original probabilities, and I end up with a posterior probability. Okay. Now, posterior probability is what it uses to classify. Right? So whichever one is the highest probability wins. So if it's 50, you know, it's 0. 0.5001, that one wins. So even in a situation where you can't really guess what it should be, it's kind of a coin flip, uh, which one ever mathematically has the slightly higher number to the nth decimal will win. Okay, no ties. So that's step two. Step three is how accurate did we get? Okay. So we're using classify um, dot accuracy. And accuracy, what you put into it, remember, is the classifier that you just built and then the test set. So I got about 78, 79% accuracy. Okay. That's not bad given that all we're doing is looking at what words people use. Okay. So we can get almost 80% right just by looking at the list of words that, are, that they are using. Okay. I used to think this was not a very good score until I was talking to a friend of mine and he was like, holy cow, that's amazing. So um, this is actually a pretty good score. Now, if we were Netflix, this would not be a good score. Um, but they have much larger data sets and more complicated algorithms than just simply word definition. But if I look at the top 2,000 words, um, I can get 80% right. That's pretty, um, pretty good. Let's now look at the most informative features. So remember, you can use show most informative features. The front word here is the classifier that you built. Okay. Most informative features. I just picked the top 20 just to see. And this is where you can tell it's heavily tied to what's in the data. So there's going to be some names of different actors and actresses here. So Schumacher, Mino, Cervani, Cervari. Um, so Justin, and then if you run this at a different time, sometimes Timberlake comes up. And that is either a good thing, because then you can tell how people feel about specific actors, or it's um, overriding too much overriding information. Like it might be one bad movie that they made, right? Um, so names sometimes to me seem tricky. You could consider taking them out, trying this again, because people really hated if the movie had Schumacher. If their if their review contained the word Schumacher, they hated it. Okay. And then there there are things that you aren't too surprising, right? Unimaginative is bad, so it's negative to positive. It's eight to one grown, <laughs> atrocious, uh, pretty much all of these are negative. Turkey was an interesting one. Shoddy, awful, it's another name. Waste, ugh, ridiculous. Uh, um, but here's one that's sort of interestingly backwards. Right? So the word unravel generally would be considered kind of a negative word, but in this case it actually positively predicts um, it's more likely to be a positive review if it contains the word unravel. Okay. Now, uh, like I said, names can be good or bad here. All right. 
and then you can look at more of these, but once it hits about three to one, it's maybe not the best predictor. There's not a good cutoff score for this, um, but we would just look at them as most useful to least useful. What mistakes are we making though? Okay. So we're gonna create an empty errors data set, okay, an empty list, remember lists are the uh, square brackets. I'm going to loop over the original data. Check this out. This is the original data. This is not the um, brain fart. This is not the feature data. Okay, it's the original data. Okay, so for each document and its tag, here this is positive or negative. I think earlier I was calling it, um, wow, it's been a long day. Oh, category, right? Tag here is maybe not the best word because we use that a lot for part of speech. So we could just go back and change this to category. Remember, you make these up. And then it would give me the same answer, basically. Very slowly. <laughs> there it goes. All right, so for each document and category, so either positive or negative, in our original training set of documents, we're going to take a guess. To do that, we're going to put in a classifier.classify. This is how it calculates which one it should be. But since we're using our original document, I have to apply the features to that document. The classifier requires that we have that dictionary, but here we're looping over the original documents so we can print them back out again. So you want to loop over the original documents so you can see the document with what's wrong versus looking at the feature extractors. You can actually go either way here. I think it's easier if you look at the original document, like the person's name, rather than the extracted feature, the letter N doesn't mean a whole lot to me, but if I look at the person's name, I can figure it out better. Um, if the guess is wrong, okay, stick it in a uh, the errors list so we can print it back out. Category here is positive or negative. What the guess was, so right answer, wrong answer, and what the document was we used to extract that answer. Now these to me are hard to read because they're very lengthy. So this one where is where pandas, um, the data frame manager in Python would be much better. But uh, just you could just print them out. I just think it'd be easier if we stuck them in a data frame. But here for each tag, guess, and document, so we can again we can call this category clean this up here. Um, the correct guess for this first one was um, the correct answer is negative. Our guess um, should have been guess is other. Okay, so there's more than positive and negative, I guess. Uh, and then printed the document. And so I'd have to like kind of go through what words are included. Okay. Um, to me, this is not the easiest thing to see because uh, it prints out bad, but you would read the reviews and see if you could figure out why you're getting errors on each one of these. Um, one reason I did this here was to just to show you like it's easier to read the original review even if it's printing poorly, right? So it's printing as a list of words in this slide. But that's much easier, right? Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back is a dumb movie disguised in a smarmy interior, right? So this um, should have been a negative review, but we missed it. Uh, much easier to read than this. Contains plot, false. Contains colon, false. Contains two, false. Like this, much harder to read than the original review. So that's why we loop over the original documents and print those out rather than printing out the feature extractors. All right, so that last one is a good one for sentiment. And so it has positive and negative and apparently other in it as well. So we're predicting more than two categories here. Um, then another example might be having like 15 or 20 categories. Uh, so dialogue act type, this is more of a, a a classification problem when you're trying to give things keywords. So let's say you're taking in um, 
lots of different articles and you're trying to sort them out. So like these seven go together, these seven go together. Um, maybe something like a cluster analysis. If a cluster analysis is an unsupervised learning task. So instead, if I want to supervise this, I know what the categories are from previous work and now I need to classify them into our system correctly. <clears throat> this would be, sometimes it's called dialogue acts. Okay. It really should be called giving things keywords, but the technical phrase is dialogue acts. Um, so we've looked at sentence tokenizers and part of speech taggers, and this is effectively a dialogue act problem. So determining what part of speech something is, is a fancy classification. And that classification is, you know, it could have 10 different categories if we use the universal tag set, or it can have as many as your um, golden rule has. So like a brown cat, um, data set actually has like 40 or 60 different categories. And so if, um, when you build a unigram tagger for that, you are essentially doing what we're about to do. So uh, the dialogue act kind of problem is the same problem that part of speech tagging has. Uh, so we could classify these as statements, as questions, as emotions, as greetings. So you'll see that here. Um, and we still probably want to work at the feature word level. And so this level, we might actually be looking for symbols to help us classify rather than, excuse me, um, rather than just the words themselves. So now the question marks and punctuation become interesting, um, especially because oh, stop. what we're going to do is do this on the chat corpus. Now the chat corpus, remember, has a more naturalistic, <laughs> I don't want to call this speech, uh, talking back and forth on the internet. So like emojis are going to be very useful versus before where colons maybe were not the most useful feature sets. So um, feature extraction works essentially the same way. Like the function is basically the same, but what might be useful is really different. So I'm going to pull out all those posts. And this is an XML data set. So we've looked at HTML, we've done text, we've done words. And so this is just a slightly different format. So it's XML, which just means that it's stacked. Okay, so XML is kind of a hierarchical scheme um, that maybe allows you to keep the structure, the hierarchy of the data. Uh, another format that's similar is JSON. And so I'm just going to build my function. Step one, right? Create your features. So I'm going to define a feature, a uh, dialogue act feature. It's going to build a little feature dictionary. And then literally it's going to determine what words are in it and what words aren't. <clears throat> the biggest distinction between this one and the one before um, was for the sentiment uh, movie review one. We looked at only the top 2,000 words. In this one, we're looking at every word. Um, and really what the, the first one is trying to prove a point that you can classify up to almost 80% correct by looking at just a small subset of English. Okay. Uh, this one is going to be better because we really need maybe a lot of different word types. Okay. So in the previous example, we might be able to do even better if we used all the words rather than just 2000. All right, so we're going to word tokenize each post and just literally say it does it contain this word or not so it contains equals true right. second set step is create your test and train data sets okay. so um what am i doing here oh so for the feature sets okay, this is all of the data i am going to pull out here is the important part um, the post from the, why is this run sideways here? Yeah, okay. For the posts, okay, let me back up one so I can make this a little clear. Posts here is the list of all of the different people talking back and forth. So like uh, when you hit enter, 
if you're used to using, you know, like Twitter, each one of the tweets would be a post, or if you're using like Twitch or something, um, every time you hit enter, that's a post. Okay. Or Slack, or any one of these chat areas. So I'm going to take the post.text, that's the actual text in the post. Then I'm going to get its class. Okay, this is very specific to this corpus, how these two work here. But what I've done is grab the text and the class. In this scenario, I'm just going to just automatically apply my Dialog Act features. Before, what we did was we pulled them out, created test train, and then created the feature sets. I like that set of steps a little better, but um, there are multiple ways to do this. And so I'm trying to, I'm following the book here. Um, they're showing you, you could apply the features right at the beginning. I don't like doing that because then it's hard to do the errors part, but you can. And then loop over all of our posts. So I just wanted to print two of them so you could look at what that looks like. Okay, so that's this one. It's a list of tuples with embedded dictionaries. So one reason the last uh, chapter we really talked about what are the different types of data structures in Python and how do you tell them apart, right, was because you end up with this sort of thing. Right? So it's a list. So here's my little list markers. The whole thing is a list of tuples. Here's one tuple. Okay. First part of the tuple is a dictionary. So it starts here at contains and ends here at true. And so it, you're just seeing all the words. So now I'm left with this gay name. Okay. And that particular one, the uh, category or the class is a statement. The second one, just because we printed two of them, is um, an emoji, so it's colon and then P. Okay. And then it's been labeled as emotion. So this is all three structures we've spent some time talking about. It's a list of tuples with dictionaries embedded. Always need to shuffle. Okay. I created my train and test sets. Okay. Step three is to do the classification. So just with my naive Bayes classifier, I'm going to train it on my training set. Right? So this is the, the step where we're examining all the features and figuring out which ones are most predictive. The last step is to test the accuracy. Okay? So remember for accuracy, you put in the classifier and then the test set, and we're getting 67% correct. That doesn't seem like maybe the best until you realize that there's 50 15, 12 or 15, don't quite remember, different categories. So, did I print out to print out somewhere? I don't think I did. Um, so, let's just say there are 12. If there are 12 categories, random chance is 8%. Okay. If there are 15 categories, since I can't quite remember, random chance would be 6 or 7%. Okay. And so, 67 doesn't seem that bad. Now that I know that just randomly guessing, which is about the worst that you can do, right, um, sort of our bottom asymptote, bottom limit here, is somewhere between 6 and 8%. 67% doesn't seem that bad. We can use the most informative features. Let's see if I can zoom out. There we go. If it contains the word high, it is most likely to be greet, a greeting, over a system message, 400 to 1. When you have multiple categories, and we're no longer doing binary prediction, you have to remember that it's comparing the likelihood of every one to every other one. And so if it contains high, it's going to probably be a greeting one but it's going to show you the ratio of like greeting to everything else. So if it's, uh, they might show up multiple times where high is uh, greeting to system, but it's also greeting to emotion. Um, <clears throat> so what we see here is it's like 400 to one. If it contains by, it's a by statement. Um, if it contains the greater than sign, it's kind of listed as other. 
This is uh, usually people making little emojis. If it contains uh, no, this is a negative answer. If it contains yes, it's a yes answer, <laughs> right? Nope, BRB is a buy. So these sort of, these make sense. Okay. If we read these, we can kind of figure out that, yeah, this, this makes sense. Like what is a WH question? But interesting thing here is the letter U is also a WH question over system messages. That makes more sense if you remember this as a chat data set. So people are saying things like, what about you? But we're using the word letter U to represent the word U. So uh, the knowledge of what's in this data set is also, also helpful. So you have to be kind of familiar with um, talk chat speak for this to make sense. Some other things that we might do is look at textual entanglement. Okay. This is where we're getting into more complex classification procedures. Okay. So we might have questions like a, a statement. So I have a statement. Aaron has purple hair. Because it do. Okay. Then uh, we would feed this to the computer and then we'd ask the computer essentially the same question. Does Aaron have purple hair? Okay. And the computer has to see if the question can logically be answered from the document provided. Okay. So it could, this question could be, does Aaron have blue hair? And the question can logically be answered from the, do, from the documents provided. Okay. So um, it's not, textual entailment isn't the idea of can it answer the question, it's that can the question be answered at all from the previous work? So if you ask it, you know, if you talk, <clears throat> excuse me, if, you, if we inputted something like, um, Aaron has a beagle dog who's snoring <laughs> on the other side of the room, um, then the next question, does Aaron have purple hair? You can't answer that. You don't know. You haven't been provided the right information. Okay. So let's look at some of the challenges that people have put out there. So every year there's a textual entailment challenge to create better algorithms. That a little bit. Okay, so they would get these texts. Okay. This person representing Iran, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Uh, can I answer the question, China is a member of SEO, given this text? And the answer here is true. You can answer this question, okay. even if the answer to the question is false. <laughs> but uh, I can answer the question because it does actually explain that SEO is the association that binds Russia, China, and four former Soviet republics. Okay. So clearly China is part of this. The second one, though, right, um, is essentially saying, who are the members of this uh, LLC company? Okay. And then it has a question about Carolina Analytic Library, which is never mentioned in the text. Okay. So this person is mentioned in the text, but it's not clear if they're a shareholder of this other laboratory. Okay. So you could not logically answer the question with this text. So that's the challenge. How might you do this? Okay. And it seems like that might be kind of hard. This is something that humans should be able to do. Like, I don't know. Essentially, you're asking, is the answer yes or no? Or I don't know because you didn't tell me enough information. And you can actually do quite well on this challenge. You probably wouldn't win, but you could do well if you simply looked at the the word overlap between the text and the hypothesis. So if the hypothesis text, all of these words occur in the provided document, then the answer is likely true. Because if all of the same words are in there, then I probably have enough information to answer the question. If not all of the same words are in there, then I don't. So what you get is a sort of gradient of 100% of the same words occur to 0% of the same words occur, and you kind of have to figure out how to deal with the middle. 
Okay, so what if there's 50% of the words are there? Okay. So this one would be where about 50% of the words are there, or maybe a little less, the person's name. So you'd have to guess no on this one because you'd need maybe 60% of the words to match before you would know if you can answer it or not. Okay. And so uh, they run this challenge all the time. People make uh, much more complicated algorithms, but a good first start is simply do the words match or not. And that is effectively what we've been doing. It, uh, for our classifiers, we've been looking at like, what words do they have? This is the next step. Do the words match or not? <laughs> All right, so let's get a little bit more into valuation. There's more to it than just, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, evaluate, right, the dot evaluate option. So we have been looking at the accuracy of it, which just says how many times does the correct answer and the guess match, or do they match? But there's a couple of other metrics that we can use to evaluate how good we're doing. So accuracy is clearly very important, but there are a couple of other things that we can do as well. So let's look at those. Um, and the first big consideration is the actual test set itself. Okay. So our test set, we hopefully this is just review, is the evaluation tool that we're going to use to determine how well we're doing. Okay. It's really important to keep that separate from the training set, otherwise we are just testing if the model ran the training set correctly, because okay. it will simply pair it back, which means it just simply reproduces the original answers and doesn't learn anything. Um, but there's kind of a paradox here. Uh, it's sort of ironic, but you don't want the test set and the training set to be very similar. Okay. Um, because if they're basically the same data set, even if they're different examples, has, have we actually learned anything? Or are we simply just repeating the training data? So when you have testing and training data, you want them to be fairly, not variable, but at least a little bit different um, so that you know that your model generalizes to other models. Okay. So if the test and training data are pretty much the same, it makes me less confident that this will apply to other data sets. And then the question is, how much data do I actually need to do this? Sometimes you're just stuck with whatever data you have, right? So I'm working with somebody on classifying chat speech, and that's really difficult um, because we just don't have a good chat data set that has polarity marks, so um, positive and negative. And so we kind of have to deal with the fact, well, I've got plenty of Amazon reviews, and I've got Yelp reviews, and there's some Twitter data. Hopefully that's close enough. But if I had actual chat data, this would be better. But, you know, kind of left with whatever data I have. Um, thankfully, there's a ton of Twitter data. <laughs> it's like 4 million lives or something crazy. Um, but, uh, so the answer isn't like regular statistics where it's like, I need enough power, right? So I gotta have enough, a large enough sample size to find a significant effect. Here, we're just hoping we have a large enough set to generalize to new data. And so we want to put most of the data in our training set um, so that any kind of idiosyncratic responses or random responses are sort of washed out by the larger training data. We should consider the number of labels and the frequency of those labels. So this is the, uh, a huge problem for logistic regression. A little less for naive Bayes, but still a problem. Um, if in, let's say, log regression, you have data that has a 90% to 10% split, okay? if you're trying to classify something where you're trying to get 10, the smaller group is only 10% of the time, okay? your logistic model will always be significant and useful because no matter as long as you guess the larger category, you're going to get it right 90% of the time, which looks good. Okay. So you could always be wrong on the smaller category and still have a good model. 
uh, I wouldn't say the model's very good, actually, but it, mathematically, the model looks good. So we really have to consider the frequency of especially the smallest label. So sometimes you cannot, literally cannot control how often these things happen, but you should have a large enough data set that the smallest label is still represented well. So some people have suggested you need at least 50 examples of the smallest category. You want diversity of different types of examples for each label, positive, negative, or question. Label here is whatever category you're grouping them into. And people tend to like this like 10%, 90% to 10% split for testing. Yeah, that's really popular. I've seen 20, 80, I've seen 70, 30, like it, it, there's no one rule, but uh, 90, 10 is probably the most popular version of it. Now accuracy we've been doing. Accuracy is not too hard to understand. Right? <clears throat> if I have two labels, chance is 50-50. So anytime you look at the accuracy number, you need to think about what is chance. Okay. So if I have four labels, chance is 25%. And then we were just talking about the example where there were 12 labels and chance is 8%. Okay. So if I have two labels and I get 60% right, I'm not doing very well because it's only slightly above chance. If I have 10 labels and I get 60% right, I'm doing pretty well because chance is 10%. So that accuracy needs to be placed in context of what would literal guessing look like. Um, and then this is one thing we were just talking about this. So um, it's easy to predict a label that occurs 80% of the time because um, if you always guess that label, you'll get it right 80% of the time. So you just have to be careful when looking at these numbers, and we'll talk about how to do this in a minute, that you're contextualizing them within the size of their group. Um, in a perfect world, it would be great to have an even number of each category, but reality is that that doesn't always happen. I don't know what my, my mouse must be dying. I've been wonky. All right, let's talk about precision and recall. I was trying to zoom out, but it won't let me. Smaller? There we go. All right, so precision and recall, if you are familiar with um, receiver operator characteristics, this would also, it's the same idea, or um, type one and type two errors in regular statistics. These have different names, but they're all the same concept. Okay. So let's say that you put in, there's this kind of like four by four square here of, um, the, the top left here is when you were trying to label it and you got it right. Okay. So this is the correct label you got, you know, you guessed positive and it is positive. Okay. Uh, so in statistics, this would be called power, right? You guessed that it was significant and it was significant, right? Or yeah, power, right? Yes. You found it when it was there. And, but in, in receiver operator curves, this is called a true positive. So I'm going to relate this to uh, medical testing because to me, this is the easiest way to conceptualize this stuff. Let's say um, you are measuring an HIV test, right? And this would say it said that you had HIV and you do. It is a true positive. A false positive is when it says that you have the disease, but you don't. Um, so this would be a type one error in statistics, uh, where you say something happened and it didn't. A false negative here would be that it missed the effect. Okay, this is um, beta or type two errors in statistics, where you actually do have the disease, but your test came back negative. Okay. So you've missed the fact that you have this. Okay. Sometimes it's called a miss. Um, a hit, uh, a miss, what's a false positive? It's kind of another name. I've forgotten it now, but um, a true negative, and statistics, this doesn't really have a name, it's kind of odd, 
But a true negative is when it's not, you don't have the disease and it says you don't have the disease. And so this is a correct rejection is another term for this. So three or four different fields have used these kind of hits and misses idea. Um, and they all have different names, unfortunately. And so I feel like I, I'm a stats person, so it's easy for me to remember the stats ones. But um, I feel like if you just think about this as, as a, some sort of test. Lots of people talk about pregnancy tests, right? Um, so it says you're pregnant and you are. It says you're pregnant and you're not. <laughs> it says you're not and you're not. And this would be, it says you're not and you are. So um, if you need more help with these, I would just search um, uh, receiver operator curves and it has a lot of these kind of pictures. Ah, what was that? Gosh, I told you like my mouse is acting crazy. Oh, it must be it wants to update. How annoying. All right, I'll do that later. Um, <clears throat> so in the book, it talks about, let's say you're trying to find a document on your computer. Um, false alarm. That's the word I was looking for. Uh, so I, I'm trying to, let's say I'm trying to find a specific file on my computer that is someone's name. Okay. And so uh, when I grade your uh, assignments, I download them all from Moodle and then it tags it with your name. So I'm trying to find your document. Okay. True positives are when I find your document. So I've identified it as your document. It's called HIT. A true negative is when I don't see another student's document. Okay, I've correctly rejected the fact that that document does not have your name in it. A false positive is when it tells me about your emails. Okay, so I'm looking for your Word docs and then it will, my computer will sometimes pull up an email you've sent me. So that's a false alarm. It's not the one I'm looking for. And then a false negative is when I can't find your do stupid document. Right, so I'm, I've typed your name wrong or um, my computer just isn't indexing correctly. And that would be where I missed it, couldn't find it. Okay. Given all of that, we can calculate three different statistics that are very popular for classification scenarios. Okay. First one is precision. Okay. And this is a measure of true positives to false positives. Okay. So it's how many that we identified that were relevant that are actually correct. Okay. So precision, if I back up, is across here. How many of these are relevant? Um, hold on one second. Let me tell us the clip. What? Excellent. Thank you. That was, that was freaking out my computer. I'm afraid it's about to these. Click these real quick. Perfect. All right. Mm -hmm. Just so my computer doesn't crash here. So the precision, back to real topics here, is um, how many true positives to a ratio of how many things that you marked as relevant. Recall is down, so how many true positives there are to things that should have been marked as relevant. And this terminology really kind of comes from this idea that precision is a measure of like all of the things that I've marked, here's the proportion that are actually correct. Whereas recall is kind of more of a memory thing. Here are all the ones that I brought up, but there are some that I forgot about. Um, you want both of those to be high. The S score is a measure of precision and recall together. Okay? And it's the harmonic mean of these. Uh, you can't just average them because they have different denominators. Okay, so they're working with slightly different data sets, so to speak, because false positives and false negatives are different. Um, and so we would create a harmonic mean of them, which is two times precision times recall divided by precision plus recall. All of these numbers we want to be very high if we can. To do this in Python, what I'm going to do is open the um, or import precision recall and F measure from the metric scores data set, or not data set, um, package. You should already have this. It downloads with an LTK and also collections. 
I am going to create empty dictionaries of our reference set and our test set. And these are just made up names, so you can call them whatever you want. Then I'm going to loop over our test set. Okay, notice that I'm looping over the, the kind of um, already processed data. So this is the already feature constructed data. Okay. Enumerate just means like make it loop. Okay. Uh, so looping over these, and enumerate also helps you count. Um, uh, looping over the count of features and labels, I am adding the real label to my reference set. So ref set here is the actual things that are part of this category. The uh, observed, well, I'm going to classify it, okay, so classify that category, and then put what it, if it should have gone into this list into the test set. So effectively what's ha kind of happening here is in the reference set we're creating, I can actually just, well I printed the emotion one. Let me see if I can print the whole thing. Oops, nope. Can I print the whole thing? It is a dictionary. It'll look crazy. Yeah, okay. So scrolling would be nice. Here we go. So what is happening is in the Greek category, that is line numbers, 0, 4, 9, blah, blah, blah. In the yes, no question category, that's line numbers, 768, yada, yada, yada. So it's essentially sorting them out into which ones are um, emotions, which ones are greets, which ones are yes, no's from our dialogue act example. And this is just the function that helps us sort them out. Okay. So it says, here's the one that it goes into for real. These are the answers. Test said here is which one would I have classified it as. Okay. So I have the answer and my actual classification. Now we're talking. I can look at how many times the answer and the actual classification match. So accuracy would be just a measure of how many of the uh, ones that are in the actual answer I got right. But remember that precision is a measure of true positives to false positives. True positive, false, false positives. So I have true positives here. 2, 13, I'm sorry, 103, 5, 532. Ooh, 22 is a guess that I got wrong. So this one would be a false positive. 538 is right, 27. Yada, yada, yada. 548 is a guess. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Here it is. I missed 542. So this is where we can see the true positives, false positives, and false negatives. Okay. So we missed 542. We should have had it, but we don't. Once you build that, now you can start to uh, calculate precision recall and F-score but you do this by category. Okay. So it's not global. It's for each category label, what are we getting right? So I printed the keys out just so I could see what my category options are, and that's where I think I got 12. 13, 14, 15, it's actually 15. Okay. So I would wanna do this either 15 times cutting and pasting or like a little loop where I printed out each one. But at the moment I just printed out emotion. So how often am I getting emotion precise, so to speak? This is not accuracy. I could do that too. But um, so you use the precision function. The first argument to the function is the actual answer. The second argument is the guess. So be sure you do it in that order or you'll get those numbers wrong. And so for uh, our emotion category, we're really precise. Okay. When it says that uh, it's an emotion one, it probably is. Okay. Uh, the other terms that I forgot, it's got sensitivity and specificity. Okay. So if you need more help with this idea of precision and recall, you can also look up sensitivity and specificity. This is how sensitive it is. 
So if it tells me that it's an emotion one, 93% of the time that is actually correct. Recall here is okay, it's almost 80%, which means that we're finding about 80% of them from, from memory, so to speak, and we're missing about 20% is the other idea. The F scar is the sort of harmonic mean between the two, since again, they don't have different denominators, and 85% is pretty good. And I would do this one category at a time so that I could see how good emotion is versus how good is a yes no question versus how good is an other. And this is where you can really figure out which category you want to look at for errors. Because if you're getting one category really wrong, that's the one you want to create a most informative feature list on. Right? What am I missing on this category and what are the errors for this category only um, and then you can start to really narrow into why can't you get positive sentiment right right or why are we missing more in the negative category etc so these are metrics that you will see printed a lot with these uh, classification scenarios um, by category and remember category is just which label you're giving it other thing that we can do is create what's called a confusion matrix. Uh, these are not super helpful when there's two categories because the you know there's only one way to get it wrong. Confusion matrices are better when you have three or more categories. On the homework, you're going to build one for two categories just so that you can practice. But they're in, in reality, they're much better when you have a bunch of categories. Because when you get it wrong, where are you getting it wrong is the question. So confusion matrix is a matrix of the right answer to the guessed answer. And so it's essentially a conditional frequency distribution of what you guessed to what you, um, I'm sorry, what the right answer was to what you guessed. Uh, that diagonal there is the right, is getting it right. So if the correct answer was question, yes, no question, and I guessed cut yes, no question, that is how many times I got it right. right? That's a true positive. Everything on the off diagonal is an incorrect answer. So to do that, what I need to do is pull up the answers. Okay, so I need a list of all of the actual labels. So remember, we call this tag. Again, we could change it to category because I think that's a better label. So in my test set, here are all of the category labels. So this is the answer key, is the way I think about this. I printed the length just so I can figure out if I have a problem here in a minute what I'm doing wrong. So I have a thousand of these basically. The next thing I did was I calculated the guesses. So for each document and category, uh, what I want to do, yeah, okay, that's fine, is um, loop over those and guess. So here is our classifier. It's classifying the document, and here's the guess. I'm going to add that guess to my overall list of guesses. And so here's my my answers. So we have the answers, the answer key, and then the and then the answers that we guessed. And this is how we could calculate accuracy if we wanted to, or we just let the computer do it. But essentially, that's what it's doing, is creating an answer key and then your answers and calculating the percent overlap. And I printed, again, the length just to make sure they're the same, because this whole thing will crash and burn if your answer key is longer than your guesses or vice versa. Then the function is just confusion matrix. You put in the correct answer first and then the guess. Uh, almost every NLTK function, when you have like answers, uh, two sets of answers, the correct one goes first and the guess comes second. And then I just told it to print out in pretty format. So pretty format, um, sort by count. So put the, the one with the me most problems first. We can do show percents equals true. You can also turn that off. And then I to make this print um, on the slide correctly, I truncated it at nine categories. There are actually 15 categories, so we should print the whole thing, but we just haven't. 
um, and that's because uh, spacing. Right. All right. Now, the only thing I don't like about this is that they're completely conditionalized. Okay. What that means is that when it says 15% here, it's not that I'm getting 15% of them right. That means that 15% of the data set is cl correctly classified as a statement. Okay. So this would be better if it was conditionalized only on the row or only on the column. Right. So marginalized, I guess. Um, but this is that 15% of the correct classifications are statements. So I find that a little confusing. But um, so these numbers here are also partially biased by how big they are. So there are a lot of system messages, right? Probably because we're getting 21% of the correct answers are system messages. So here it looks like we're doing really bad for accept messages, but that probably is because that's a small one of the smallest categories. So I wish this conditionalized by row. Like I'm getting 20% of, or I'm getting 87% of the statements correct. And there are ways to get that, but um, try to keep it where you can look up these things in the book. Right. Uh, excuse me. Anyway, so the, the key that you want to look for is where the larger percents are on the off diagonal. If there's a dot, that means you never guessed that one. So that's good. Means you haven't missed that. And so what I always do is I look for the one that has the most missed spots. So statements here are clearly getting missed both directions. Okay. So uh, these are the right answers here. These are the answers we guessed. Okay. So when it's a statement, we are guessing a lot of different things. Okay. Uh, when we guess statement, it's actually a lot of different things as well. Um, when I guess system, it's pretty much always system. Okay. But when I find a system one, I came missing it back and forth. So you have to think about this across or down, right? So when I guess a statement, that's this way, uh, I'm guessing a kind of a broad range of different ones. And so sometimes I'm getting it really wrong by guessing a motion. Right? When the answer is actually statement, you can see that we've guessed a bunch of different things. So you have to think about this directionally. But this would allow me to then investigate my errors better. Okay, so the purpose of these really is to just see like where are the largest number of errors? Okay, and I would start with statement because it's got the largest and most, the most variable percents of missings. Right? Um, and then I might try emphasis here because it has a lot of errors as well. <clears throat> Last little topic here is kind of more things that you can do or should do, and cross-validation is one of those. Okay. Now, we won't really do this in this class because we just don't have the data for it, but cross-validation is where you take many data sets and you do lots of tests on your algorithm. So you're testing the algorithm over and over again. And this is what Netflix and Google and Amazon, these people have ginormous amounts of data, right? do is they have many different little large data sets that they're constantly improving their algorithm because they're validating it across lots of different scenarios. You can also do uh, in fold validation and this is where you take a data set and break it into n folds or parts. Okay. Uh, you might do 10, you might do 15, so you pick a set, uh, pick a size to divide into and I think that's really based on the size of the data that you have. You train the data on all of the subsets but one, then test the data on that one data set, and then you rotate. So if I have 10 of them, what I do is I test on 1 through 9, I'm sorry, train on 1 through 9, test on 10. Then I would train on 1 through 8 and 10 and test on 9, etc. Uh, sometimes this is called the leave one out method. And you take all of your scores, accuracy, precision, recall, and you average them. Okay, so you get sort of this overall evaluation score. The nice thing about infold validation, sometimes I see it called k-fold validation, I don't know that the letter matters, um, is that any idiosyncras idiosyncrasies in the data set, any like weird little moments of randomization or um, breaking in the data get kind of averaged across the data. So 
was really nice because um, if you manage to get a weird random run, it at least is a weird random run once and it kind of gets washed out across all of them. Uh, and then cross-validation also applies to new data. So if you have new data sets, you can test and train on those to make sure that it um, generalizes to lots of different types of data. All right, so that is classification in a nutshell. Um, we have covered from start to finish uh, some like simple binary classification, which we did with um, Naive Base. Then we talked about um, sentiment with the movie reviews data set. And then we talked about dialogue act or just sort of larger uh, classification scenarios with the chat corpus data set. There are others. There are, there's no limit here. So classification is sort of the broad term that covers everything from actually part of speech tagging to traditional sentiment. Uh, this is what most people pick for their final project is building some sort of classifier uh, and applying it to something. Um, and this to me is the chapter that everyone really likes <laughs> because this is kind of like what the cool things that you can do by using individual words is work on uh, grouping things together. So supervised clustering is what's happening.